Hey guys, um, I'm presenting two of the books that I read for the um, Victories and Defeat. Um, so I had um, two books. I had Over, uh, Why the Ollies Won um, by Richard Overy, and I had No Simple Victory, World War II in Europe, 1939-1945 by Norman Davies. Both are good books. Um, neither are too crazy long, like 300 or 400 if I remember correctly. I'll start with, um, start with the Norman Davies, actually. I switched my mind. Ha. Huh. Keep you on your toes. Um, so, I'll, this is, again, No Simple Victory, World War II in Europe, 1939-1904 by Norman Davies. And this piece is, I mean, less a content-based approach to the argument than it's, like, an, it's actually strangely an approach-oriented argument. It's sort of, in it, Davies analyzes conventional wisdom in approaching the Second World War and refutes it. Citing it as sort of clumsy, inaccurate, and self-centered. Um, he just doesn't like how people generally analyze the more over, the like the broader themes of the war. He thinks that they're premature. A lot of times, he says that. Um, I mean, the book's argument is present in its analysis of the war itself, and it sort of uh, strives, at least, it proclaimedly strives for objectivity and causes course consequences. Obviously, all books are going to. We can presume that they're trying to do that, but this one was very over in the idea that it wanted to try and achieve that more than other books that I've read. Um, the argument is sort of like the idea that an ideological consideration of the war and its abstract and amorphous components is impossible without an extremely firm grounding in its complete course, and that's sort of at the core of the book's observations. Davies utilizes his actual explanations of events to remind the reader that the conventional approach to studying the conflict is often limited. Nothing is as it seems, so yeah, exactly like you saw, I sort of stated there. Um, he doesn't like it when people, without a really firm understanding of why the war happened, what happened, and the real like logistics of the, of the scenario, both uh, troop numbers, resources, public uh, relations, all those things, he feels like people sort of lose focus on those smaller things and try and look at the forest without understanding what kinds of trees are in it, sort of. Um, methods wise, um, here Davies uses sort of like an unusual approach, I thought, in telling this piece. Um, in general, the chapters are really long, um, there's only six, and they're topical. Um, whether they be like politics, civilians, or warfare, those are three of them. And so, within those chapters, um, which are not set in any particular chronological configuration, there are numerous subdivisions of content varying in structure based on the chapter. Some chapters vary discuss various like time periods, eras, and conflicts, um, which general which are generally in order of conception, not termination, when they brought up, which whenever they uh, began, not necessarily whenever they ended. Alternately, um, when like in the civilians chapter, there's no like chronological constraints to be considered. Um, it seemed like they just sort of went wherever they felt would best serve their their structure. So it's, I don't know that there's a set structure um, in the a, a chronological portions of the book that sort of just different, dealt with different facets of the same thing, just however Davies felt like it would be better laid out to guide the reader through it. Um, throughout the book, Davies uses like a really tr a vast number of books, journals, essays, and other forms of historical literature to piece together his statements and arguments. The volume is uh, tremendous, and it ranges from Stalin, Roosevelt, and the other world uh, leaders' personal and public statements to official war records and... Uh, to labor statistics. The sources are particularly focused in the various nations' views of each other, which is sort of an emphasis not witnessed in other publications that certainly has a lot of depth and diversity to the piece. And due to the comprehensive approach of this piece, a specific emphasis on like one particular source type is sort of hard to identify. They're all used to a great extent. Um, strengths of this piece, um, I would say the biggest strength of this piece is certainly its sort of comprehensive nature. Um, in that it genuinely takes the reader through a vast variety of the facets of World War II. It obviously omits the Pacific Theater because it's a book on World War II in Europe, um, but it does its best uh, to piece together a comprehensive narrative and acknowledge the Pacific Theater's effects on Europe when they're applicable. Um, additionally, the charts, when they were provided, um, were particularly helpful in establishing the author's meaning when communicating timelines, uh, charts depicting uh, statistics such as deaths, economic output, and military capability were utilized effectively as well. Uh, the author finds great strength in exploring, uh, albeit at a surface level, a variety of relatively unpopular subjects uh, in relation to World War II, 
and those chapters of civilians and then portrayals especially dive into a great variety of subjects such as uh, refugees, resettlement, and other geopolitical issues in the war, often overlooked um, or neglected. These in particular make the piece worth read if only for an intro into those specific topics. Um, weaknesses, although it's sort of, it is a comprehensive piece as I just mentioned in the strengths, um, the nonlinear nature of the piece forces the reader to sort of keep in mind constantly the general timeline of the war, which like an uninitiated reader might not have a great view on. Like it's, I feel like everyone sort of knows early 1940s in their head is when it starts and mid 1940s is when it ends. But um, because it's not like laid out chronologically, it's hard to sometimes going chapter to chapter or sequence to sequence to remember what's happened, what hasn't yet, who's in command of what, all those things, and who's controlling where. So for like someone that's either not initiated can be tough, or someone that it's just sometimes mentally sort of frustrating to just be like, okay, where, okay, okay, and sort of reevaluate every every few pages where you are within the whole historical context. Um, keeping that in mind, the individual dives into the pocket subjects are probably not deep enough to truly engage those um, that are well enough first to, to comprehend the book's format. I mean, I, I don't want to explain that properly, but like, because it's so comprehensive, you have to keep going back, but because it's so comprehensive, if you are pretty well versed, if for like you guys obviously will be at this point, um, if once you do have a pretty good understanding of the timeline, you're probably not really finding it super, I thought... Um, it's not a huge wealth of knowledge on any particular subject, so if you really want to know about really any of these topics in, con in the context of World War II, um, it's probably not a great, a great spot. Uh, the earlier chapters, especially those of like warfare and politics, I thought were just essentially compressed versions of other numerous World War II studies, um, and you almost get them on the, on the side with any book on World War II you read just because they come with the piece. Um, it was an, it was an engaging read to be sure. I thought it was well written, strong command of prose, but it it likely serves better as like a complimentary piece to another another book rather rather steeped in history than than that of an introductionary or survey type book. I just thought, um, yeah, if you know your stuff, it's probably um, surface level. If you're just looking at, like a couple of basic key information points on refugees, resettlement, or whatever in the war naval power, all those kinds of things, it might work, but I would say for you guys, I'd probably look, I mean, maybe start off with this book, and then just deep dive in other sources using it, because it really is comprehensive, but it doesn't do a deep dive on any of them. Um, moving on, it is a good book, though, I shouldn't, I feel like I'm writing it off, but I'm not. Um, Richard Overy's Why the Allies Won, um, basically, the this is sort of another one in which the author more criticizes how it's how historians view it than the history itself. Um, the I they sort of say the idea that allies are destined to win and that the axis was destined to fall for whatever reason. Um, generally, generally, ooh, words are hard. Lies on unsteady or at the very least misunderstood premises. General perception that the tactical superiority, moral superiority, or industrial might give the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union a clear cut path towards victory is a massive over oversimplification not representative of the reality of World War II. While those factors, I mean, obviously helped uh, sway the balance towards the Allies in many ways, none of them were guaranteed, um, and none of them were alone were enough to win the war. World War II was a deeply complex war with numerous variables in the air. Uh, the die could have landed on the Axis numbers as, as easily as they did uh, the Allies in many cases, and it's due to the fact that enough rolled in the favor of the Allies that they won, while most of the you know, stereotypical explanations for the war conclusions hold water, absolutely, it's, it's not like they're, they're fallacies, it's just, the, over here sort of clearly demonstrates that they are much more complex than they seem, and each precondition, precondition for victory had, had its own set of preconditions, um, and it's straight from my presses for a minute, it's just like, when we talk about, like, World War Two, and even in class, because this is, it's an easy way to comprehend it, we basically say, I mean, the Axis had the element of surprise, they had speed, they had blah, 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 but, the Allies had basically the U.S. and Russia, and then the Bulldog and Britain fighting the whole time. But we had superior resources, technology, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, I mean, initially that wasn't true, especially in terms of technology. And just it's more complex than that. Why did we have these things? What what, what little motivators did we have that were necessary to achieve those um, superiorities in terms of resources and industrial might? 
tactic, tactical superiority. It, it didn't happen overnight, and it wasn't predestined. That's the whole argument, that it's really easy to read history backwards, um, even though it was lived forwards, and it's a mistake. And so it, it feels like, um, a, I want to say, a, a criticism of how people remember World War II. Um, methodology, this piece is clearly set in a very topical manner. Um, it's divided into two main, major pieces. The first is an introduction, the last is a conclusion. It's funny how that works. And then two through nine cover um, naval powers, um, the battles of Stalingrad and Kirk's, Kursk, excuse me, um, bombing, just w like bombing campaigns in both uh, Germany, Japan, and England primarily. Uh, the invasion of France, economics, technology in the military, um, the individuals leading the Allies, and then the moral equations driving the various forces, like, sort of goes into depth, um, sort of, on both sides, what were the morals, what were those moral factors, and how did their people perceive them. Um, the various source types are used to sort of support the larger claims made in the theses, and are usually, like, shorter quotations and paraphrases. Um, the book is definitely military history broadly. Um, and it sort of dives into this, into the specifics chapter by chapter. Sources, um, the author here utilizes, I mean, uh, n numerous historical journals to supplement his research and, bol uh, and knowledge, as well as bolster his statement's credibility. Uh, in addition to the vast arrangement of academic journals, overutilizes, I mean, which is pretty normal. I think I'm seeing at this point within World War II history, so many of the private correspondences between Allied and Axis personnel um, that sort of led an increased clarity as to the situation. Um, and then official death statistics and military reports are utilized along map, alongside maps of battle sites that also help to sort of elucidate um, situations and consequences, basically, as far as strengths and weaknesses strengths. Um, I mean, this book relies really heavily on its ability to sort of quickly disseminate information on a variety of subjects without getting lost in the details that aren't uh, absolutely necessary for the comprehension of the message. Um, it's because it's obviously it's doing pretty good. I feel um, short analyses of those various topics, which are all crucial, but it doesn't get lost in the mud. And it's very quick, quick to the point. Each chapter sort of has a thesis within the, the overarching piece, and he doesn't stray from that. Every word is designed to point back to it while enhancing the. The uh, reader's knowledge, so I think they did a good job of that. Um, the ability, uh, I thought, of the piece to cover numerous facets of the war, um, describe their impacts on each nation, and to do so in just under, here we are, 325 pages is, I mean, I mean that's a, it's a feat. I'm struggling to write our paper for this class now, and it's, it's so easy to go over, because there's so much information to be written. So, and then also, I just thought, um, that the the prose is written in a really engaging and quick to read manner. It flows well and it allows ease in consumption. Um, it's not like you're banging it hip, uh, your head against the wall like the, the 900 Days Siege of Leningrad or the Moscow 1941 paper, uh, books were. Weaknesses, um, although the maps are present, they're uh, generally pretty far and few in between. And then, I mean, there there's some pretty lengthy um, and generally long description. Ooh, excuse me, discussions of troop movements, um, and I felt, um, looking back on the piece, that it really would have been helpful to have um, more maps and schematics, and then just more detailed within them. It was really, really easy to, like, not be able to picture what they're saying if they're talking about various troop formations and stuff. Um, they might have, like, one map, but they would talk about five different movements and retreats and whatever, and you're like, okay, where is this? And it's just really hard to picture. So it really would have been uh, improved by, I think, more of those. And then, additionally, I thought the structure of the book made so that the various topics either felt overly long or, like, really excessively succinct. Um, like, the depth of the Allied Leadership chapter felt overdone due to their general recognition. Like, I don't know about you, well, I, I can guess that most of you, whether or not you've done, like, a biography or anything on Churchill, FDR, and Stalin, you can pretty much say with confidence who they were or what they stood for their general personalities so i'm like why are we using so much space on this area especially when you're trying to cover so much so i that frustrated me and then on the other end like the chapters of industrial manufacturing and then the bombing campaigns were pretty pretty succinct and pretty I mean, almost blips and they were good and they were informative 
but how much could they have been expanded? Um, I don't know if he was meeting a page maximum or he just, maybe he didn't have any more to write on those subjects while fitting into the thesis, um, which is something every author encounters, obviously, but I really would have liked to see those expanded and probably those personality um, sections um, condensed a little bit. But overall, um, it's a really good book, and there's a lot of strengths. Um, definitely want to, don't want to downplay those. And it's, it's worth the read. They both are. This one, they're both really cool sort of um, reflections on historiography, um, as well as the war itself. And um, like I sort of said, just to recap, um, Ovaries, Why the Allies Won sort of, is a is a critique of how people simplify the causes and consequences of war and then the fact that, like how we won i guess um they feel like most of the common um claims to victory are oversimplified in the eye of, like they it's just from the modern perspective that we're able to do so when they weren't and then davis's uh no simple victory um is sort of a criticism of forming ideological ideas about the overarching themes of the war without really having a boots on the ground perspective and so they try to provide that. Um, they're both really good. Um, I preferred the Richard Overy one, Why the Allies one, but definitely both worth the read. Um, and yeah, they're good stuff. Um, I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. Thanks.